What's up everybody, I'm Johnny Omega, back with another countdown video. This time I'm looking at all the movies I saw in 2021 and I'm giving you my picks for the 10 best ones. And as always, my list isn't perfect, it's just mine. 0% objective and 100% biased. So without any further ado, let's get into the list. And starting the list off at number 10, I have Eternals. Now this is a movie that really seems to split the audience. Most people either like it or they don't. The majority of people that think it's just okay are definitely the minority. For me, this movie did a great job of being outside of the box of a normal MCU movie while also still feeling like one at the same time. It didn't need to have a fight sequence every 10 minutes. It didn't need to be lockstep connected with everything else going on in the MCU. It didn't even have characters that you really even need to see again. But what it did have was a very interesting self-contained story that I didn't expect to like as much as I did. Seeing what these characters have to go through while being stuck on earth for thousands of years and seeing how they help humanity is something that I can understand why some people might find boring if you're going into the movie expecting a generic Marvel story. But if you go into the movie with an open mind and the expectation that you're about to watch the least marvelous movie that Marvel has ever marveled, I think you'll enjoy it. Next on the list at number 9 I have The Suicide Squad. Now while I am a fan of the original Suicide Squad movie, I gotta admit that this movie is an improvement in almost every way. James Gunn took a ragtag team of characters that the mainstream audience doesn't know and made them all fit together in a team even though a lot of these characters don't even stick around long enough for you to get attached to them. It's like James Gunn looked at DC and said give me a list of all the characters that you have no intentions on using and watch me work my magic. Then they gave him an R rating and free reign to do pretty much whatever he wanted with minimal interference from the studio. I'm not at all surprised we got the movie we got. It was violent but not overly violent. Funny but not in a corny way with a bunch of forced jokes. The best way to describe this movie is like if Guardians of the Galaxy was turned up to 11. Certain directors are just really good at making certain type of movies and I think this IP just fits perfectly into James Gunn's wheelhouse and I hope he comes back to make another one. Coming in at number 8, I have King Richard. If you're looking for a feel-good type movie that you can watch with the entire family, King Richard is definitely the movie I would suggest that came out in 2021. Now there has been some criticism with this movie because it doesn't focus primarily on Venus and Serena, but I actually think that focusing on their father was the better choice. This movie is about their struggle, and the struggle didn't come once they made it to the pro stage. The struggle is what the family went through to get them to that stage. And anybody that knows about Venus and Serena knows that their father was a big part of that. He was basically LeVar Ball without the arrogance and the wormhole we call social media. And the guy playing Richard is some small time actor named Will Smith. I'm not sure if you ever heard of him before, but I think he did an okay job in this movie. He might even get a little Oscar buzz if he's lucky. I don't know. Now obviously that was complete sarcasm. Will Smith did an incredible job in this movie and he's definitely going to get nominated for an Oscar. Next on the list at number 7 I have Last Night in Soho. Now this is easily the movie that surprised me the most this year. And I know I might be in a minority by making this statement, but I'm not really a big Edgar Wright fan. Baby Driver is the only movie that he's made that I really like, so when I heard about this movie, I really wasn't that interested. Then I saw the trailer and my interest level went up a little bit, but I still wasn't gung-ho about seeing the movie. Then I actually saw the movie. I walked out of that theater not only knowing that I had a new favorite Edgar Wright movie, but I also had a movie that's probably going to be in my end of the year top 10. Last Night in Soho was a suspense movie that has some twists and turns, an ending that you won't see coming, and a story that's going to keep you thoroughly invested the entire time. And visually, this movie is really cool to look at too. The use of vibrant colors in the movie really helps differentiate the 60s from the modern time and just makes it hard for your eyes to come off the screen. You see how eye-catching this is and it's just a picture, so just imagine what the whole movie looks like. But none of that really matters unless you have a story that holds up, and this movie definitely has a story that holds up. And it's also a movie that you don't want to have spoiled for you, so if you haven't seen this movie yet, just keep that in mind before watching it. Next on the list at number 6, I have Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Marvel's first movie with a primarily Asian cast dealing with Asian culture and it didn't disappoint. If you're into martial arts and really good fight choreography when it comes to the MCU, it doesn't really get much better than this. Not only that, but there were so many other parts of this movie that worked really well for me. The biggest thing was the family dynamic. Seeing the connection with the family and the issues that they also have and how they try to resolve those conflicts is a depth in storytelling that the MCU really isn't known for, but I think they did a really good job with doing that in this movie. The comedy in this movie really worked. 
two. Granted, most of it comes from the same character that doesn't show up until the third act, but it still worked. I also like that there wasn't a forced romance in this movie too. The main character has a best friend that's a female and I was completely surprised that Marvel went the entire movie without showing any forms of non-platonicness. I'm not 100% sure that's a word, but that's what I'm going with. And I also like how self-contained this movie was. Even though it is part of the MCU, it didn't spend a whole lot of time world building with the MCU or setting up for a sequel. It was here's the characters, here's the conflict, here's the resolution. Sometimes simple is just better. Now before I get into the rest of the list, let me just say that I only gave out five Omega level ratings in all of 2021, so for me, these next five movies are the best of the best of the year. At number five, I had The Last Duel. And for 2021, this movie gets the award for best movie that nobody saw. Every year there's a movie that comes out like this that checks every box. Great script, great cast, great director, and also a great example of how not to market a movie. I'm not sure how the studio dropped the ball on this because the concept should have sold itself. A man's wife accuses his former best friend of raping her, so he challenges him to what would eventually be the last sanctioned duels to the death in recorded history. The movie's told in a way where you get the same story told from three different sides. The side of the accused, the side of the accuser, and the side of the accuser's husband, which all culminates to a duel to the death. These are olden times where the last man standing is the person that's determined to be the one telling the truth, and if it ends up being the accused, then the woman who accused him will be burned alive as punishment for bearing false witness. On Oscar night, do not be surprised if this movie gets nominated for Best Screenplay, Best Picture, and at least one person from this cast gets nominated for their acting. Next on the list at number four, I have Candyman. Every year on my list, there's at least one. And I think Candyman is going to be the movie that not only gets me the most flack for even being on this list, but also being as high as it is. But I don't care what anyone says, because I think this movie is great. Whenever I tell people that I didn't like the new Space Jam or the new Coming to America movie, the most common response that I get is that I didn't really give it a fair chance and that I'm just comparing it to the original. And this is a movie that I'll always bring up in response to that, because I cannot think that a sequel is better than the original, but still like the sequel. This movie is easily the best sequel in the entire franchise, and I love how this movie gives nods to the original without overdoing it, does its own thing without straying too far from what happened in the original, and has a great mixture of being suspenseful and scary without falling into the generic horror movie tropes. Simply put, if you're looking for a good horror double feature to watch during the Halloween season, Candyman 92 and Candyman 21 should definitely be in consideration. Now before I break into my top three of the year, let me first thank you guys for sticking with me this far, and also let me show you guys a few honorable mentions. I hold at your neck the gom java. Poison needle. Instant death. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box, and you die. It's in the box. Pain. Next on the list of number three, we have Spider-Man No Way Home. Now it's not too often that the best movie in a trilogy is the third movie, but Spider-Man No Way Home is a perfect example of that. I've seen every Spider-Man movie in theaters opening weekend, and I can honestly say that No Way Home is the best theatrical experience that I've ever had in a Spider-Man movie. It's just crazy to me how many emotions on the spectrum this movie hit. After I finished watching this movie the first time, I sat in my car thinking to myself, I think I just watched the best Spider-Man movie ever made. And just to be sure, I got on my AMC app and I got tickets to watch this movie again the next day before I even left the parking lot. That's how impactful this movie was to me. The first act starts off in generic MCU fashion, but when the movie picks up, it really picks up. Stakes get really real, really fast, and the movie crescendos in a way that you never saw coming. 
And I'm not talking about the appearance of other characters either. I'm talking about the way that this movie literally changes the landscape of the MCU moving forward. Now granted that change primarily just affects Spider-Man, but to have a main superhero in a space where they can have their own adventures without having to worry about where other MCU characters are is pretty unique. But either way, I'm super excited to see where Spider-Man goes from here, and if you've seen the movie too, I know I'm not alone in that statement. Let's be honest here, this movie just cracked the top 10 highest grossing movies of all time, so at this point, who hasn't seen it? Next on the list of number two, I have Zack Snyder's Justice League. Can we just stop for a second and enjoy the fact that we even got this movie? I mean, the fact that this movie even exists is a triumph to all of us who hashtag release the Snyder Cut. But then you add on the fact that this movie is absolutely amazing, hashtag restore the Snyderverse. To me, this isn't just the best comic book movie in the DCEU. It's not just the best comic book movie of 2021, but it's also on my list of top 10 comic book movies of all time. What Zack Snyder was able to accomplish with these characters was borderline perfection. This movie was four hours long and I loved every minute of it. I watched this movie twice in a 24 hour period and both times laser focus locked in never got bored and if nothing else this movie should definitely show studios that you don't always need to meddle in a director's vision. True you don't want to give every director free reign to do whatever they want but Zack Snyder deserved a lot better than what Warner Brothers originally gave him and this movie just validates that. I didn't hate the original Justice League when I first saw it, but I will admit that I didn't like it as much the second time I saw it. And after seeing this version of the movie, I can honestly say without a shadow of a doubt that I'll never watch the monstrosity again that Joss Whedon gave us. I would literally throw the Blu-ray away if I had ever taken the time out to buy it. I actually now want to buy a copy of the movie just to throw it away. That's how good the Snyder Cut was. And coming in at number one, I have Judas and the Black Messiah. With the way the Academy handled the 2020 situation in regards to movies, Judas and the Black Messiah actually qualified for the last Oscars. It won two, but it was nominated for six, including Best Picture, and it deserved every bit of praise that it got. The movie released in February, so it was actually my number one movie of the year for 11 months. Never would have thought a first quarter movie would have done that, but that just goes to show you how good this movie actually is. In my opinion, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield give what's easily their best performance of their career. But then when you add in the performances of Jesse Clemens, Dominique Fishback, and everyone else, it's no surprise this movie was nominated for Best Picture. And then the fact that it's based on a true story is just a cherry on top. This movie doesn't seem to hold back at all with how corrupt the FBI was back in the 60s. And it definitely leaves a blemish on American history that a lot of people ain't gonna want to talk about. But even if you look past all that, the story of Fred Hampton I think is something that everybody should see. I honestly didn't know much about him going into the movie, but seeing what I saw definitely threw me for a loop. Anyone who's asked me about movies during 2021 knows I've been seeing the praises of this film all year long and it really surprises me how many people I come across and I only have not seen this movie but haven't even heard of it. But like I said it's not just the content that makes this movie good it's also the writing, the directing, and definitely the acting. And this will probably be the only time that I ever get a chance to talk about a movie in my yearly roundup that has already gotten Oscar attention but if it had to be any movie I'm glad it was this one. So that's my list of the top 10 movies of 2021. What did you guys think? Any movies you think should have been on the list? Any movies you think shouldn't have? Comment below and let me know your thoughts. And as always, I'm Johnny Omega. If you like what you've seen, hit that thumbs up and I'll see y'all next time.